Dr. Kraft, you get a thumbs up if you can hear me. Ms. Dooley, thumbs up if you can hear me. Ms. McKeever, thumbs up if you can hear us. Great. Um, we are live just because I needed to make that happen. And it's 4.59, so it looks like we got about a minute left until we can get all set up and ready. Good afternoon, everyone. It's June 27th, 2023, and I call this meeting to order. Do we have a motion at this time to grant access to our school board meeting? Dr. Kraft, Ms. Emily Dooley, and Ms. Jennifer McKeever. So moved. No second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you. Next, I'd like to have a moment of silence. Now let us stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you do a roll call? Yes, sir. Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Bryson Morseberger. Here. Ms. Dooley. Here. I'm here, if you called my name. Dr. Kraft? Oh, uh, present. Ms. McKeever? Here. Mr. Morris? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Do a motion to adopt for approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion approved. We now have comments from the community. 
and I would like to start with Ms. Christine Esposito. Please state your name and your address. I live in the city and I have for the last eight years been a gifted specialist at Johnson Elementary. On the morning of June 3rd, I posted on Facebook about how happy I was to work at Johnson. I recounted a moment I witnessed during the school-wide morning meeting the day before that reminded me why it is so important for all families to be represented and celebrated in our schools. It was one of those moments in your life where if you had ever been uncertain about the beauty and power of love, those doubts would have vanished forever. Imagine my horror and quite frankly, the horror of most of the Johnson School staff on Monday morning to find that video of our students was beginning to circulate, not to celebrate the fact that our fourth grade students planned and executed a school-wide morning meeting on their own, one that focused on getting ready for summer, for acknowledging and celebrating Pride Month, as we acknowledge and celebrate many different cultural months throughout the year, but instead use that video to attack the Johnson community and to put our community in danger. There's room for disagreement on many issues, but we will not debate the inherent right of the LGBTQ community to exist, to be accepted, to be loved, and to thrive within our schools. Public schools are for the public, the whole public. When one group's views require the marginalization, othering, or outright erasure, of members of our community, they do not belong in public school. Over the last few years, we've seen what happens when schools are singled out as they work to ensure that every student and every family feels seen and included in our communities. Anyone who took even a moment to think about the current environment surrounding these issues would not have recorded or released that video because they'd have understood they were putting our students and the wider community at risk. They'd have remembered what it was like to be the focal point of an entire country because outside hate groups brought violence to our community as we tried to right the wrongs in our community's history. They'd have thought better of scoring points on the backs of our students. They didn't. Quite simply, the person who recorded that video has forfeited their right to belong to the Johnson community. I'm asking that the consequences of releasing this video reflect the reality that they not only violated school policy, but put our community needlessly at risk. Thank you, Ms. Esposito. Do we have anyone else in the room would like to come forth and speak? Are there any, are there any, is there anyone in the Zoom room? If so, please raise your hands to be recognized. Yeah, same thing, I'll just ask if you're in the attendees gallery and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand or, um, make us aware of that in the chat at this time so we can promote you up to speaking position. Okay, thank you. Our next item on the agenda is the adoption of the consent agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. We have a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion passed. Thank you. Next on the agenda of action items. I think Ms. Kim Powell will come forth. Good evening, Chairman Bryant, members of the board and Dr. Gurley, um, we are bringing before you for action the um, middle school naming recommendation that was um, discussed at the previous board meeting. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions? I move that we um, change the name of Buford to Charlottesville Middle School upon the recommendation of the superintendent. I'll second that. We had two seconds. So. Can I ask a point of clarification that name change will not change until, can you just remind me of the timing, please? Fall 2025, is that right? So the recommendation was that the name change take place when the, um, <laughs> six, the seventh and eighth graders move into the new building. So with construction, 
it's a little bit difficult to say exactly when that will be, but I believe it was projected um, to be in 2025. Um, I guess my point of clarification, just Buford will remain until we're just, yeah, just so we're all on the same page. Thank you. The other point of clarification that I would just like to mention is there's a process we're going to be going through with the state with regard to recognizing the grade, the new grade configuration and uh, renaming all of those things. So we, we, we have direction or suggestion from BMDO. We will also be going through this process with, with VDOE um, in conjunction with the new grade configuration and so forth. So they may weigh in and that could also tweak the timeline, but to your point, it's not happening immediately. But it is, what is happening immediately is the design work and other work, some of which does involve needing to know the name. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Uh, what I was saying, if I may address the audience, is that um, the name change doesn't go into effect immediately. It does inform design decisions and design work that is happening through the summer and into the fall in particular. Um, some of the procurement then also associated with the design. Those things are happening within the next six to 12 months that that work begins. Um, as far as the actual changing of the name, what Ms. Dooley was referring to is that it doesn't happen next school year on you know, the first day of school. This coming school year, it is still Buford Middle School because there is um, a recommendation that it, um, the name change coincide with when the seventh and eighth graders move into the new con newly constructed building. We will also be working with VDOE as required to inform that to you know, file paperwork about the, how the grade levels are gonna change and, and all of that and with the new building and they require certain paperwork, they may weigh in on the timing of when that change actually goes into effect, VDOE would. Okay, I'm gonna go in for discussion. Oh, I just wanted to add that as a school board and school division, our commitment is to no longer name schools after people. And so this is in keeping with that as well, but as a reminder, uh, we no longer are moving in the direction of naming schools after people. That was, I just wanted to add that for clarification. And Ms. Torres, and Ms. Morris. So we have a first and second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? So the ayes have it, 70 zero. Change the name of Buford Middle School to Charlottesville Middle School. Next on the agenda is Dr. Odie. She's coming on sort of policy update. Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening. At the June 1st school board meeting, Ms. Swift brought to you and presented the policy updates at that time. And tonight, the superintendent recommends that you take action. So at this time, do we have a motion to update the policy? I move that we approve the updated policies as recommended by the superintendent. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? So the ayes have it. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Odie. Thank you. Next, Ms. Hoover. Good evening, Mr. Bryan and Dr. Gurley and school board members. I'm here to ask for a technical budget amendment on the FY 2024 budget. As you may recall, when we were going through the budget development for 2024, we included the preschool program. That preschool program was for the regular three and four year olds. And as we were going forth, 
uh, realized that the preschool program needed to be consolidated into our regular program because they are an intricate part of that. So I'm asking uh, the school board to uh, approve a technical budget amendment transferring $1,236,962 from the general fund to the special revenue fund. This does not change our bottom line. It just changes the amount between the special revenue and the general fund. Do we have a motion? Um, I move that we approve the technical budget amendment as recommended. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Ms. Hoover. Do you have another one? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The, the next item that you have in front of us is as we are planning and uh, our fiscal year end and projecting how our fiscal year end is gonna look for 2023. We are anticipating having a surplus. Um, that surplus is uh, based on us drawing down more ESSER three funding than what we have uh, budget. Uh, this is anticipation of what we're hearing coming out of the federal government of them pulling back those funds if they're not uh, obligated encumbered. Um, and the other, um, and then our unfilled vacancy savings. So one of the uh, items that we would like to do is again, we want to transfer money from the general fund to the special revenue fund to cover for another year of our social emotional learner counsel counselors. Uh, this will, um, so if you recall, we did the exact same uh, transfer last year uh, for this program. So taking last year's uh, set aside, and if the board approves this year set aside, uh, we will have um, set aside or accumulate a million dollars to keep this program going through fiscal year 2026. So is there a motion? I move that we approve the funds transfer as requested. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Yes, please. Ms. Torres. Yeah, thank you. So just a little explanation, if, if you don't mind, or I have a couple questions. So we, based on, on the report that we received, our fiscal year end surplus is, is anticipated to be what? Um, I'm looking at about $4 million. And, and, that, and that will share between the uh, city and the schools because we have a gain share agreement. So, and again, if you could review for us and the public what how that works. So how much goes to the city? How much do we keep? And um, the surplus that we have at the end of the fiscal year the first 100,000 comes back to the um, schools, and then anything over that is split 50 50. So, roughly, well, then roughly you're talking about 100.9 million. How much goes to the city? I, I said about 1.9 million out of that 4 million. Did we ever, did we ever have a conversation with them about? asking that that or does that go to our the school CIP? Um, if you recall from the CIP process, we uh, made verbal uh, agreements that whatever we have at our fiscal year end that we would like it to go towards the capital projects fund, uh, particularly for the school construction project. So we have a verbal request and did we get a verbal confirmation back? I mean, is that yeah, I mean, we just have so much going on and this would be great if we could start to sock this away for the preschool program or, or whatever else we might be looking at. 
So Michael Goddard in facilities development and I have started this conversation and um, he and I will be starting this summer preparing the next round of the CIP uh, work that you all review. You know, we go through that CIP process every fall. And so um, this conversation, you know, we were where we were kind of working towards the middle school until now we've um, thankfully gotten over that hump. And so uh, now we know what our next hill is to climb, if you will. I think everyone's aware of that. We don't have anything beyond the verbal conversations at this point, but this next round of CIP work that we're looking, that we're starting now and we'll be presenting around mid September, October timeframe, I believe is when that meeting occurs. That's when we come together again in earnest with city council represented, you know, other city leaders, uh, board representation, and we start to um, hone in in a more solid way on those plans. But um, I think everyone is, a, a, there's a general awareness, there's continuing conversation, but it is all verbal at this point. I appreciate that. And I know that, you know, some of the counselors, you know, went on record and saying that it was, they felt it was really important that we start to even create, you know, a pre preschool CIP holding it, bay it, or whatever we're going to call it. So I, you know, I, I plan to continue to bring that up. I was really excited to hear them say that um, and, and just, you know, planning, but trying to not be where we were in the last year of having to really work hard and work well with council to, to figure all of that out. But if we can start to put in some deposits early, we that have, would be great. I feel like we have great precedents from our recent successes working together um, on how to do this. And, and we're all looking full, we're all thinking ahead, being forward thinking about, you know, making the best use we can out of our resources. I cannot speak for council or city administration or city leadership, but I can certainly tell you the conversations are continuing and, the, and I think we have that great precedent. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And then I was just curious, I'm sorry, Mr. Bryant. Um, so we're funding for another year for the, yes. S, for the social emotional positions. Can we fund beyond that or can we only do a year at a time? Well, I mean, I know we're wanting to on-ramp those into our actual budget. But. Well, our, our, our plan is to, at some point, bring them back into the general fund. Right. So this is money set aside to allow us to plan the move of them into the general fund. Great, thank you. That's great. Ms. Morseberger, of course. Ms. Dooley. Any questions? Okay, um, Dr. Kraft, Ms. McKeever. Okay, we have a first. No. Okay, thank you. So we have a first and second, so we're ready for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed, seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is items for discussion. Now, 2023-2028 strategic plan. Ms. Chuck. Good evening, Mr. Bryant and school board members, Dr. Gurley. Uh, we are pleased to be giving you an introduction today to what is really kind of the first reading of the full strategic plan. I have shown you various parts and pieces. You have had uh, work sessions. We've had the steering committee working all the way through the executive leadership team has been working all the way through. But when we met in June, we were still doing a lot of uh, detail work on the, on the small details about the specific metrics, the specific strategies, things like that. We do not intend to go through and discuss this line by line with you tonight. We don't think that's a good use of your time or, or this evening's time. But what we'd like to do is just give you an introduction to the booklet, to how that's organized and invite you to read it over the next couple of weeks uh, through July 11. And you can email any final changes, suggestions, edits to us at that point. Then we will review that, give it back to the designer, get a, a, a fresh copy back to you. I think the goal is to get it back to you by July 24th so that you'll have the final refinements in place well before the vote on August 1st. So with that speaking, I'm just gonna jump into this process. Um, here's the timeline. We've pretty much stuck to it. I think by shifting this first reading from the beginning of the month till now, we may be behind by a few weeks, but still we've pretty much stuck to the timeline. Uh, we have done the various engagements that we promised to do. Some of these slides should look very familiar by now. 
here's here's where we start to get to some new or slightly revised things. Here is the the current cover. And all those uh, words where you see draft plan right there, that is one way that you can access the full plan for you and anyone else who is hoping to uh, look into it more carefully and submit feedback. Uh, here is the revised mission, vision, vision and values. It's, it's not very changed from what we have been showing for the last um, perhaps month or so. Same thing, the portrait of a graduate is not very changed from what we have shown but we appreciate the small edits that people have been passing along. Uh, these four big priority areas are, I think, unchanged from what we have shown. And again, from there, we start getting into the smaller details, and that's what we've really been kind of hashing out in the last month or so. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to invite Dr. Odie up to speak about priority one and associated goals. And again, we're not going to dive deeply here, we're just offering you an introduction and an invitation. And I can speak with, with personal experience that when I looked deeply into one of these first ones, I found a metric that didn't match up with its thing. So you're still going to find small things like that. And I, you know, that hopefully just the more eyes, the better for these final refinements. Dr. Odie. All right, well, good evening again. Uh, I'm gonna start it with our first priority and the associate, associated goals, as Ms. Chuck said. Uh, so here you see our first priority is to increase academic achievement. Uh, the three goals are shown here. All CCS learners will graduate equipped with a plan for the future. Also, um, our CCS learners will have access to rigorous inclusive and relevant learning experiences. And did I skip one? Number three, what did All I- All CCS learners will demonstrate tiny. mastery. Yes, <laughs> right there. And math, mm -hmm. Leading to the elimination of achievement and opportunity gaps. All right, thank you. Okay, all right, so next slide. Um, as Ms. Chuck said, we're going to just give you a sampling. Uh, our, our presentation is organized by the targets and the measurements, the strategies, and the key performance indicators. Uh, so here uh, you'll see the first one, uh, maintaining the graduation rate um, that is at or above the state average across all student membership groups. So we want to do that. And of course, the measurement is going to be the actual graduation rate. And then we want to have 100% of our students um, who will be equipped with a post-secondary plan. So you see four things that we'll be using there to help us to measure that we're actually doing that work. Uh, we want to increase the number of CHS students enrolled at KTEC by 10% annually. And of course, we'll be looking at that enrollment as we go along through the years. And then uh, as far as our AP and dual enrollment courses, we want to make sure that the completion of those courses, it matches the demographics um, of our enrollment here at CCS. And then again, uh, we're going to be looking at the enrollment of our advanced placement and our dual enrollment programs. I Did you turn this on, Pat? Yeah, push the button. Thanks. So again, just to clarify, there there are not merely four target areas in this section. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just want to make sure. I'm I was sorry. about I to say, you know. <laughs> as a reminder, these are just four of the samples. As you look further into the presentation, you'll see that there are many more targets and measurements. Um, that you will want you to take a look at over these next several weeks. We're just giving you a little bite of it today. So if you would go on to the next side, slide here, we have the strategies. And if you were to have that lined up with the targets and measurements, you'll see that the strategies that we have there match uh, the targets that we had before you. So uh, the color coding there also, just look over at the right, um, at the implementation plan, you'll see that we have that yellow color is or orange, whichever you want to call it, is sort of the 
planning, the blue is for the implementation and the purple is for the refinement. So uh, some of the strategies that you'll see as you're looking at the plan, we're already working on those. So we're already in implementation. Some of them, we're gonna be starting that work. So we'll start the planning part. Uh, so that, that's there for you to see. I'm not gonna read that word for word, if that's okay with you. And so um, I'll go on to priority two, which is to provide a culture of safety, wellness and belonging. And so we've got those three goals there uh, before you that, that align with this um, priority. We wanna make sure that our kids are safe. Uh, we're going to support social, emotional and physical wellness. We're gonna foster a sense of community and we're gonna promote a safe and positive learning environment for our students. Again, we've got a sampling of the uh, targets, uh, three here that for, for your uh, viewing enjoyment and the measurements that go with it. Um, all schools in the division will demonstrate annual improvement on the implementation of tiered, and, tiered supports. As you know, we utilize uh, MTSS, you've heard us say VTSS or CTSS before, we're really focusing on multi-tiered systems of supports and there are the measurements beside it there. Uh, the next one here, all schools will demonstrate improvement on students' uh, social emotional learning data. And so we, we do several uh, measurements there, the DESA mini, the DESA assessment, the Rethink Ed uh, data, all of those measurements there we would use for that. And then the third uh, sample that we have for you today, schools will demonstrate annual progress um, towards serving meals. Now this, does, this really falls in operations and school nutrition. So free meals, we're looking healthy meals, locally sourced meals, all of that. And so there are some measurements uh, to the right there to help us know if we're meeting that target. Next slide, please. So again, uh, these, these strategies here align with those targets there. And you can see again, the color coded section. And if you notice here, we're already in the implementation stage for each of these. Uh, there's no planning, there's no orange on these samples here. So we'll go right on into implementing over the next three, two, three, four years, and then to refinement after that. And I think that's all for me, and I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Lewis. Good, uh, good evening, um, board chair and members of the board. So the third priority is to focus on our support for staff. Staff is always gonna be a priority for the school division. Um, but as we go through the goals, one of the goals is that CCS will recruit and retain licensed and properly endorsed staff. And then all of our all of our staff will engage in meaningful, um, relevant, timely professional development. And then the third would be that we're actually going to recruit and retain teachers of color. And then we want our staff. We want them to know that we value their voice. So those are our focus areas. One of the targets, as you know, is going to be that we're going to be fully staffed. We just had a conversation about staffing. Our goal is to get staffing at 100% by September 1st, and we want to do that each year. Some of the measurements are going to be that we measure how many vacancies we have and how quickly we're able to fill those. And then we're also going to measure to make sure that they're properly endorsed. Most of the other targets will center around having the right people in the right place, giving them the right professional development. And then we're gonna to continue to grow staff internally too. So we're gonna identify cohorts of people who can move into leadership or move from an instructional assistant to a teacher so we can grow our own. Uh, next slide. 
as you can see for the implementation or planning stages, we need to establish a new, more robust recruitment plan. So we're gonna plan through that, making sure that we have partnerships with schools and colleges and communities that we're attending um, HBCU universities when we're doing our recruitment plan, as well as community colleges to make sure that we're, we're um, putting Charlottesville out there and securing the best people for the job. Um, and then we're gonna continue to follow up and make sure that we're supporting the staff once we get them on board. So we're gonna constantly be collecting data about their instructional practices, what are the needs in the building, how can we make sure that we're supporting them at the level of need. Good evening again. Um, so for priority uh, area four, we have our goals associated with ensuring effective and efficient operations. These are all areas that I'm personally very excited and passionate about, and there's a lot of exciting work going on here. We have the uh, modernization of our facilities. We have the ongoing work to um, improve our efficiencies and continue to upgrade, not just the overall facilities, but the important systems and equipment within our facilities. Um, we need to continue our work to promote sustainability and environmental awareness. And then in all things, we, we must demonstrate fiscal stewardship. Um, so again, this is a sampling of our targets. Um, the first we have the annual work to continue doing the modernization uh, projects that we've identified. It was really a, um, a sort of a big shift, a watershed moment. Some of you were on the board when this happened, but um, when we, we moved our CIP beyond just being capital maintenance and we started actually doing capital improvements. Um, that was a big improvement and a big shift. Ms. McKeever was on the CIP committee at that time, so was Ned Mickey. Um, and so I just want to take a moment and reflect on where we've been, where we were really just doing a lot of capital maintenance, and now we are actually doing modernizations, and we need to continue that work and be vigilant with that. Um, KTEC, bringing that into our portfolio, in, uh, you know, as an entirely owned entity of the Charlottesville, of Charlottesville City, is some other exciting work that we're doing. Um, and we're uh, addressing that over the course of this transition year so that that particular target will be fully accomplished when we take ownership on July 1st of uh, 2024. And then the target three here is about a, another topic that's near and dear to many of our hearts, our uh, transportation system and making sure that we um, continue to make improvements in that so that we eliminate the wait list for all, any student who wants transportation that does not live inside of this um, family responsibility or walk zones. Um, and then beyond that, just continuing to partner with the city where we've done some good work, but there's a lot more to do to improve um, bike and pedestrian infrastructure and also the CAT system. And these are things that not ju don't just benefit our school students, but they really benefit the entire community. So it's a lot of exciting work to be done there. And um, for, for the targets, these are, again, the sampling of the strategies. I will tell you that one of my areas for edit is to go back through some of these P's versus I's because I debate with myself, are we still in the P or are we really in the I? And so um, that's just on my to-do list to make sure that this really reflects what stage we are in uh, and where we're going as we work through these different strategies. So that is our little sampling, and I hope it gives you a sense of how the book is organized and what you'll find when you do a deep dive. So our next step is for you all, for the steering committee, and for the interested public to do an independent review of it, to, to submit any edits, suggestions, refinements. We really are in the refining stage, not the generate new ideas or kind of turn it all upside down on its head, but further refinements to get us in a place that we feel really good about. You can email that to me or to Amanda. I guess we put Amanda. Amanda must have changed my email address to take that off of my plate. Um, but we'll put, you can uh, email that to Amanda by uh, July 11 uh, so that we can get that turned around internally and then resubmit it out to Insight and their designer. And so they can really start building out the, the, the remaining pieces, the digital dashboard that will help people understand where we are in making progress towards these items 
and, and other elements like that that are final, you know, the final pieces of this. Then our goal is to post it out for you to have one final review to say, yes, that thing that I wanted to get fixed, did it get fixed um, by July 24th? And then the, your vote will occur at, in the uh, August 3rd meeting. And then around that same time in early August, as we, as we do staff development, as we open up our schools, we will really start rolling this out for our staff and to help the community understand what, what the work is in front of us. I believe the last slide is the familiar Q&A. So if you have any questions for me or any of my colleagues, some of, some, uh, virtually anybody has some goals or strategies here, we could speak to them. But again, our goal so much is, uh, for tonight is not really to go deep into specific questions, but just to make sure you feel comfortable with the process for how you will give it this final review. Any comments? <laughs> yeah, I'm good for that. Um, thank you for the presentation. So this draft that we have attached to this is, is the most recent and what mm -hmm. we should be working from. That is exactly right. Uh, uh, Dr. Gurley, uh, Denise Johnson, uh, James Randall, he came into town this past week and we sat down and looked at all the feedback from the steering committee at the last ones. And folks, uh, folks had emailed us some separate things, mainly from the steering committee. Um, to, and so we just went through those line by line by line to make suggestions where we could, to make fixes and edits where we could. And, and then he gave it to the designer. Okay, mm -hmm. and this is the same one that, that Dr. Johnson sent out to the steering committee That's as well, exactly correct? right, that's exactly right. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morseberg. Um, my only comment is that I think it's coming together nicely. Um, a few short Saturdays ago, I feel like I was a little bit of a negative Nelly and I was like, metrics, metrics. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like <laughs> you all told me to wait that they would be there. So I appreciate um, you all being patient with me and it's good to see um, the metrics up there. I've seen a lot of strategic plans and usually they are collecting dust on a shelf. So it's good to see that there's something we can check in with. Um, so I appreciate that. So thank you for the hard work. Thank you. Mr. Morris. Uh, overall, I feel pretty good about the process as well as the, the product that we have in front of us. Um, I will send a few couple of comments and questions, but otherwise I feel good about it. So thank you. Please do. Ms. Dooley. I'm good, thank you. Dr. Kraft. Oops. Um, I'm, I'm um, overall just really pleased and impressed with this. You know, this is my second strategic plan um, since I've been on the board. And um, they're quite different. And this one, I think, um, is very strong on accountability, uh, which I think will be a lot of work. Um, but I think it's excellent. And um, I did have a question. So should I not ask the question now? Should I send the question Go to... Wait up. What? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the, this, was, this goes back to, um, I guess, priority to <clears throat> the culture of safety, et cetera, and target to... Uh, and that has to do with the social emotional learning, um, improvement on social emotional learning. And I see the various measures that are used, being used to assess this, but I don't actually understand what's being assessed. Like, what are we really looking at there? I, I think uh, Dr. Odie could probably speak to this better than I could. I think some of it are things like, at, at, my, if I remember off the top of my head, the DESA exam, but I'll let Dr. Odie speak to speak to those. I just don't know what what are the criteria that we're looking for if students are improving in this area. Good evening, Dr. Kraft. Good um, evening. These assessments are, are assessments that are, are provided for students to complete regarding how they feel, uh, what they're experiencing uh, emotionally, socially, also their teachers complete assessments so that we can know exactly how we can support the students. So we have the DESA uh, mini that's used in elementary, the Rethink Ed, I think is used in secondary um, schools, but they're, they're assessments really to find out how students are feeling and what teachers are seeing with students. 
So we hope, and behaviorally. Yes. And, okay. and so it is our hope that um, if we're doing what we plan and, and hope to do, that our students will feel safer, will feel uh, more uh, emotionally well uh, if we are actually implementing and the, the um, target as we have said we're going to do. And I, I think also, I, I wanna jump in there too. If you, for example, if you look at the strategies, um, if you look at the strategies, um, it, just take number three for an example. Ensure the mental health, uh, social, and family support services are available. So these are going to be the things that will help us arrive at that goal that you um, had the question about. So these are just some of them, and it's they're even more in the book in the booklet when you see that, Dr. Kraft. But that's okay. really the vessel at how we will arrive at that that goal. Okay. Um, thank you. And I did find a typo and I will send it to Amanda. <laughs> thank thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Ms. McKeever. I have no question. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, it's a great document. It's, thank it you. Thank good. You. I'm still reading, mm -hmm. and absorbing, and if I have questions, I will certainly send them along. So thank, thank you, you very ladies, much. for thank you, thank you, and the strategic plan committee for all your hard work. Thank you. So, Dr. Oda, you're up again. An update on our cell phone policy. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Good evening again. As you know, we were tasked with bringing together a cell phone use committee, a student cell phone use committee to create a plan for student cell phone use in our schools, specifically Buford and CHS, where we have more challenges with student cell phone use. Next slide, please. Tonight, I will share with you our wonderful committee members' names. Several of them are here tonight. Uh, our committee's work thus far, the considerations that we had as we had our discussions and meetings, anticipated outcomes and next steps. Next slide, please. On this slide, you see our committee names. Uh, as we wanted to have a variety of voices represented, uh, here you'll see that we have students, we have teachers, we have administrators, and we had two school board members, uh, Ms. Torres and Dr. Kraft, that participated in our committee. Uh, lots of com committed, committed people. And I will say that I included, if I included anybody that came at least one time to a meeting. And we had several meetings. So again, some of our, our members, if, I don't, if you would raise your hand, if you're on the cell phone committee, we've got... I think three, three of them here tonight, uh, three of our, our a parent and two of our teachers here tonight. So thank you so much for coming. Next slide, please. Our committee met five times together on those dates. Uh, we discussed challenges with student cell phone use. I really just wanted to hear from teachers and parents and students about what they were seeing what they were experiencing uh, with cell phone, with student cell phone use. Uh, we discussed what had worked in some classes. Some teachers had more success than others uh, with cell phone use. Uh, we reviewed some articles of student cell phone uh, solutions around the state and the nation, and we shared some possible plans uh, during this, this time together. Uh, hoping to resolve our problem, those plans. Next slide, please. Some considerations that we had are shown here. Um, we considered continuing what we've already been doing, uh, but with more consistency from staff, what we heard from students is that there was, you know, some things were a, a little bit more loose in some classes than others. And, uh, you know, students really thrive on consistency. So that was a consideration. We talked about uh, continuing with the daily reminders and announcements. 
uh, the students and teachers all here. Mr. Pitt, come on the announcements each day with reminders about cell phones and, and other things. Uh, so we talked about that. Uh, we, we talked about using pencil boxes for phone storage in classrooms. Uh, that was something that was implemented some in some classes this year and it has worked in some, uh, but we did talk about that, continuing that. Uh, we even looked into something called yonder pouches. These are pouches uh, that are used often in uh, concerts or places where you go for presentations from famous people that don't want you recording their, their shows. So they ask you to put your phone in these pouches and they're, they're then secured and you can't get in it unless you have a very powerful magnet to, um, to open it up. So we, we considered that. And um, that was a discussion of having the cell phones in those pouches all day and the students uh, not having access to their phone all day. And then we discussed whether or not um, there would be cell phone breaks in class or not. We talked about cell phone zones uh, and what those zones would be. And we talked about allowing phone usage directly excuse me, during the hallways and in cafeteria uh, at lunchtime. Next slide, please. Other considerations are here. For instance, uh, the committee felt strongly that our students need a phone etiquette session. Uh, you know, we had a wonderful uh, Herbie Hancock assembly and some students were on their phone during the Herbie Hancock assembly. So, you know, even though it was an instruction, maybe we need some phone etiquette about when is appropriate and when it's just not appropriate to use phones. We talked about incentives for compliance. Kids, students work for incentives. Engaging class lessons. Um, some of the students, I, I specifically remember a student saying, in one of his classes where the teacher keeps his attention with the engagement and uh, fun, he has no desire to be on his phone. So we talked about what can we do to make sure our classes are constantly engaged and meaningful for students. Uh, we are planning to do a summer communication campaign because we feel like parents and students need to hear about this throughout the summer so that they are ready when we come back in the fall with our new procedures. And we talked about cell phone addiction. It's a, it's a sort of taboo. People don't wanna talk about that this could be a cell phone addiction, but, but we had some really good conversations about that. Um, after all of these considerations and conversations that we had, uh, we have a, a plan that the team has created. Uh, and, and so we talked a lot about this plan. The teachers came with, with a draft and we talked through it several times and, and talked about some tweaks and what we needed to do. And um, so we landed at a place. Uh, I sent the plan out. I made a couple of other tweaks because we were stuck on a couple of things. We were stuck. And uh, so I made a couple of small, what I thought, think are small changes. Um, I sent the plan to the team on June 15th and I haven't heard anything back uh, from anyone. I asked for responses or questions. I haven't heard anything. So I'm, I'm hoping that that means that the small changes that I made are acceptable. And, that, uh, and if you could click on that uh, new cell phone plan, I would love to talk about that. Please, Leslie. Okay, can you zoom it up a little bit? So we have the first column and that shows the procedures that we would put in place. The second column is the rationale, the why. You know, people want to know why we're doing things. So we wanted to be clear with that. And the third column has the interventions that we would use. 
So first looking at the procedures, uh, we would, we, our committee decided that we would have no cell phones or smart devices in instruc instructional spaces at any time during the day. That means we decided that there are no cell phone breaks in class. If we're not having cell phones in instructional spaces, then we would not say, okay, take five minutes to go and be on your phone. Students would put their phone and their AirPods because we know that phones are not the only thing that distract kids, the devices, the Apple Watch, the AirPods, those things would go in a pencil box or a pouch at the beginning of class. Class, by the way, is only between 45 minutes and 90 minutes, I believe. 90 minutes is the longest that a class is. Um, so the phone would be in the pencil box or the pouch for the class session, and it would remain there throughout the class. And they would be able to take their phone out when the bell rings and use it in the hallways and at lunchtime, if they choose to if they choose to. The pencil boxes, which are gonna be purchased uh, for every classroom would remain in the classroom so that each class could use those pencil boxes. We don't need the kids, they don't wanna walk around carrying pencil boxes all day. Um, the rationale, if we go over to the second column, the rationale is there, cell phones impede the learning of the student and of others. And we really, you know, one of our first meeting, I think, or the second, we talked about, do cell phones distract students? And the answer is yes. We, it was a resounding yes, that they are distracting. So that's why we put those procedures in place. And the interventions are there. So this is where there was, there's some slight changes. Um, so the first intervention is a student reminder. The teacher reminds the student, put the phone away. Or we're gonna have cell phone, um, no cell phones or cell phone free zone. We're gonna create signs and every classroom has a sign. The teacher can just point to the sign and say, this is a cell phone, don't forget, this is a cell phone free zone. So that's the reminder, the first uh, intervention. Second is a student conference, the student and the teacher if the student has the phone again, the student and the teacher have a conference. And um, that's where the change is because there, were, there was discussion in our team about the second intervention being too stringent because at first it was the third intervention where the administrator or the CSA comes up, gets the student and or the phone, um, but that was moved to step three. We hope we don't have to get to that if we have uh, the student reminder, the conference, and the parent, um, more of the parent contact by the teacher. Those are teacher managed behaviors, the first and second. And then, if we get to the third, um, the third intervention, then that's when the teacher calls for an administrator or a CSA to come to remove the phone uh, and or the student if that's a challenge. Um, but hopefully the phone for the day to the office uh, where it stays in the office all day. Um, if the administrator or the CSA is not immediately accessible, our wonderful committee suggested having teacher, the teachers on duty where they would escort a student to the administrator uh, to take the phone to the office. The fourth intervention, if this is continually happening, then we involve the school counselor uh, and the student and the parent again uh, for conferences to talk about what's going on here. Uh, that, you know, we know that this procedure is what we're doing school wide. So why do we continue to have this issue? Um, and then the fifth is where the administrator is more fully involved with the student and the parent. There's a conference and there is where the student and the parent get the warning that next time your phone is being pouched. And so we're purchasing, our plan is to purchase 
a number of pouches to be able to use uh, for the any instance where a student gets to intervention number six. And so if that is the case, after they've been warned that the next time you have a phone out in an instructional space, it's going to be pouched, then they will get a pouch uh, when they come to school, the phone will be placed in a pouch and is not accessible to them. The student carries the pouch with them, they have it, uh, but they can't get it opened until the end of the day. Next slide. No, no, just roll down with it, thank you. Uh, so here you see um, a little bit more about the etiquette training. We're still working on who's going to provide that etiquette training but we do want to talk with students about appropriate times to use a phone when it's not a, and how to appropriate things to do with phones uh, just reminders about appropriate things to do with phones and what is inappropriate like recording a fight uh, so we just want to do some reminders with things like that um, sending inappropriate texts to students uh, this is some etiquette training that we want to do with our students and the rationale so that students will understand the appropriate use of cell phones even outside of instructional spaces. And then the last thing here in this chart, chart is that all teachers uh, would attend a collaborative conversation led by our committing members and the admin that speaks to the expectations and accountability for the implementation of the cell phone procedures. So again, consistency is what we need. Teacher A can't say, I'm gonna let you have a cell phone break when the procedure is that we're not using cell phones in instructional spaces. Our amazing committee says, we're gonna hold our colleagues accountable. We're gonna help them understand we are all in this together. And it's not gonna be easy. We know that, but nothing great comes from things that are easy. There is a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears that have to happen for that greatness to happen. So the rationale behind the um, collaborative conversation is so that teachers can feel equipped and well-informed, and I might add supported by their colleagues, supported by their administrators. Um, this is what we're doing with that. Next slide, please. Anticipated outcomes. So I'm gonna um, look at this as sort of an if-then sort of statement statements, but we're looking at with-then. So with implementation of the cell phone plan and all staff are on board uh, with the committee helping to onboard staff and hold them accountable and hold themselves accountable and with strong communication to families and with consistency from staff and with the etiquette training for students and with teachers attending that collaborative session held by team members and with patience. We gotta pack a little patience. With all of those understanding that it may not be easy, but it will be worth it. Next slide, with all of those, then student cell phone use during instructional time will no longer be an issue. Teachers will be able to focus more on fun and engaging teaching and learning and student engagement will increase and student achievement will increase. That's the if then or with then that we're looking for with our anticipated outcomes. Next slide, please. So with our next steps, we need to roll out our plan. But our, our committee is here. Some of them are here because I, I said I'm presenting our plan to the board on the 27th. Uh, so here goes. Our next steps are to do our summer communication. The team wants to go out into the communities, communities not just send an email not just send a text. We need to reach out and touch families. And we've got um, our supervisor of equity and family engagement involved. 
with this process and we're gonna get out there and talk to families about what our plan is. Also sharing it on social media um, as, as often as we can throughout the summer in the ways that kids and families see it. I put things on Twitter. I don't know if they see my Twitter, but they have other ways that other social media that they see and we need to, to reach them. We're gonna be purchasing pencil boxes uh, for the phone storage, uh, purchasing a small number, as I mentioned, of the yonder pouches so that we can have those in case, and we hope we don't get there, but in case we get to step six with any students. Our student cell phone etiquette session, we've got to plan those. Uh, the collaborative conversation with team members, we've got to plan that. We have uh, teachers uh, on the committee that said, I'll work on the scripts, uh, you know, I'll work on that, some, some talking points for teachers. Uh, Ms. Chuck is gonna help with the phone, re phone free zone signs. Um, and there was a request, and I, we've gotta bring this back to the table. There was a request for additional technology, additional Chromebooks. Uh, and and I, I, I talked to Mr. Cuomo a bit, but we, we still need to continue that discussion about what that will look like because we don't, what we don't want to happen is for students to say, I didn't bring my Chromebook, I have to use my phone. So we want to be ready for that with additional technology on hand. Next slide, please. So again, uh, this, this is what I've covered today. Uh, this is our plan. And at this time, I am happy to answer questions. I'm gonna start with the uh, ladies online. Um, Mrs. McKeever, do you have any questions or comments? I don't at this time, thank you. I will wait, uh, reserve my comments for the, after everybody else speaks. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Kraft. Ooh. Oh, wow. <clears throat> um, yeah, I have many, many thoughts. Um, I won't say them all, but first thing I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Odie for your work in trying to shepherd this process along. It has not been easy. It isn't easy. Um, and, you know, you've really tried to um, include a lot of voices in this, um, in this process. And um, I really appreciate how you've done that. Um, this is, this is I, to me, I think a, a really hard thing for us to try to do and to figure out how to do it right. Um, so I guess I would just say now um, that, you know, I worry that, um, you know, the imp that we will still have a heavy impact on teachers, on trying to track all of the different steps, like is this student in step three or four, or, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that will need to be worked out and that may not work very well, I, I don't know. Um, um, I guess I would say that, you know, my, my psychologist heart is like going, no, you know, just keep them out of school. Um, what I'd like to say, I'd like to see um, in the sessions for students that it's not just about etiquette, that it is about helping them truly understand the deeply detrimental effect of these devices on them. And um, I'd like for us to find a way to do that um, and really try to get through to them. So, and I'm glad to help with that in any way. So I, I, to me, I think that's an essential part is to help students really see this in a different way uh, in order to bring them along and have them really embrace um, a, the purpose behind this. That's all I'll say right now. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Dooley. Blah, cell phones are <laughs> just this ongoing struggle. Um, 
I share concerns about the capacity of staff and teachers and admin to manage this process. Um, I know that you know we're having these conversations and trying to implement this policy uh, as a means of maximizing instruction. Um, and I fear that it may have the opposite result of um, teachers and administrators spending a lot of time engaging with students um, about cell phones instead of instruction. Um, I am interested to see how this plays out. I am, you know, supportive of, um, of this work. I would love to have more conversation about actually doing away with cell phones completely uh, in our school buildings. Um, I'm not sure that that was, um, you know, one of the considerations that had significant consideration um, in this go round. You know, I fear that we're going to be having the same conversation uh, a year from now. Um, I'm not sure what else I have to add. <laughs> I, I appreciate the committee's work. Um, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Morris. I do have, <clears throat> excuse me. I do have one question, um, a little bit for clarification in terms of the interventions. Um, are we looking at those to be tracked like per day um, or per class? How, how are we looking at that? Or is this cumulative over the school year? We had, we did have discussion about that and um, how it could be challenging for teachers. I think we landed that it would be cumulative. Did, do you all agree, team members? Did we land? Maybe we didn't land on that, but we did have discussions about where we would go with that um, because at step three, the phone is gone to the office. So that's not gonna happen anymore in that day for that child. So they won't go beyond step three in any day. So it has, it can't be in one day. You, you understand where I'm saying? Correct, saying? yes. Mm -hmm. so, so it is yeah. it is something we have to talk about what that's gonna look like with teachers. Um, keep tallying, you know, Johnny, this this is your third time this month, you know, so. Yeah, I, I think, and I guess it also depends on how it's tracked and coming from the classroom. I, I've seen very similar thing when we're implementing our, our cell phone policy like a, a teacher can give a reminder and have that conference in one class and then the next class the new teacher the new period doesn't know what took place on the, in the previous class um, so that's a little bit of where the clarification but I, I agree with you after step three they don't have the phone for the day anymore but how many chances do they get until they reach step three that's a good point something we'll talk about more Okay, Ms. Mossberger. I just wanted to echo uh, quickly what um, my colleagues have already said. I feel like it's a lot on the teachers um, and it's a lot of tracking. And I, I don't know how it plays out in the classroom with the teacher's time, but I also feel like maybe I'm the lone voice here, but maybe there needs to be less steps to the phone getting taken away, like a warning. And then I feel like there's a lot of, like um, Mr. Morse was saying like, oh, I know I can take it out at least two times before, you know, and then I can go to my next class. I feel like, I feel like it needs to, the phone, the consequences for not having the phone for the day maybe need to be a little quicker so that I feel like if you if you lose your phone one day, I feel like you'll think twice. Like I just feel like it's a lot on the teachers. And if we're trying to like, we're trying to help the kids to see like the, if you can't even like if I give you a warning, you've already taken it out. You got a warning. Just these phones are they're addictive. And so this is really about us, you know, looking out for you and your education in the classroom. But I think it might need to be a shorter. Uh, that's a lot of tracking for the teachers. And if it goes from class to class, that's more tracking. So that's all. I think that I think that we could be a little more, um, I, I'm not getting the words out, but 
uh, quicker to act on um, taking the cell phone for a limited amount of time while they're in the building. Ms. Torres. Thank you. Um, also wanna just, this is a tough, a tough one. Um, and, and being part or in the room, at least for part of this work, um, just want to acknowledge the fact that I think we did a nice job um, recognizing different voices, different opinions, bringing in the students and the parents who also had different um, opinions of, of which direction this should go. So I, I, I do wanna just kind of give ourselves a pat on the back for, for going through that. But I also feel like at some points and at some time, We've we've brought people to the table. We've heard the whys. We've we've given people an opportunity to talk. And and we as a division, um, and we as as leaders sometimes need to just explain why we're going to make a decision. And not everybody might be happy with that. And I think that's where I um, was at when I walked into the room. You know, as far as hearing and um, concerns from lots of different people. And, and observing um, what cell phones can do to people and to institutions and, and, and trying to get work done or being distractions. Um, and, and it was apparent and evident, you know, in some of the discussions um, that we uh, heard during that committee work, you could see that people were really going to struggle to not have those devices. So we all know that. Um, I do, you know, in looking at the interventions and, and understanding that we needed to kind of realign those a little bit. I mean, some of that, in my opinion, it, it doesn't make sense as far as how it might flow within a classroom, as far as reminder, you know, and then the next I guess I have questions because then the second intervention says we're going to have a conference but you can't really disrupt or have that conference before we get to number three. And if you've got that third warning, I mean, maybe we're calling the CSA or we're calling admin or I'm calling my coworker who happens to be free that period to come and get that. But then we're gonna also then have intervention two because we've already jumped to number three in a day. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of these things and we knew this during the work um, that we kind of, gave each other grace and had lots of conversations, but we, we really didn't have enough time to flush this out, I think, to, to figure this out. And maybe that's okay, but again, I felt like we wanted to be somewhere where we were gonna be able to really support this you know, out of the gate. And, and there's a lot of things that I know people have said they're willing to work on, but it's a lot, you know, and we're already asking so, so much of our teachers. We're already asking so, so much of, of Mr. Pitt and his team. There's already other things going on in the hallways that need to be managed. And, and I trust that, you know, things are gonna change and every year things are gonna get better, but now to add this on, I mean, I have concerns and I'm just being upfront here with my concerns and in the work that we did. Um, you know, it, it is a different era, but this is school. You know, and, and we are charged with, with trying to educate, um, not trying, but educating these students. And we need, we need them engaged and, and working with the teachers. And that's why the teachers are here. And, and as much as I um, applaud the, the teachers who, who had different opinions of how they wanted to roll this out and the work that you all did you know, outside of the committee, I know you all met and I know you tried to come up with a plan that would, that would work, but it really doesn't feel that much different you know, than what we had hoped to roll out last year, other than this is like now it's in the public and now it's before the board. Um, I, I want... I want our teachers to teach. And, and this is just a lot, you know, and, and not that these things aren't good things to happen. And, and uh, you know, the, the student education, you know, and having the conversations with staff coming in. But I think it's just a lot to even ask to, to roll out in the next month before school starts, it's a lot. You know, I mean, how many pencil boxes do we still need to order? Are they gonna be here or are they gonna be late? We don't know. We don't know what the supply chain is probably different this year than it was last year. 
you know, can we order X amount of pouches with the devices to unlock them? Or is it a, you know, we gotta purchase so many? I don't know. Um, how much is a fair amount of time to reevaluate this is if this is what we want to go and i'm not saying I, I don't honor what the teacher brought but i feel like similar to to what miss morseberger said i think i think we can get to a step where we we just have to like shut it down a little bit quicker i mean how much disruption is it going to cause you know in in a classroom for you know, me as a teacher, as opposed to somebody else. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I know that my comfort level with that disruption and, and, you know, what I need to get done in a classroom might be very different than, than somebody else. Um, so those are questions that I have and comments that I have. I, I was very honored to be in that room and to listen again. I think we did a great job listening. And I want it to be successful, but again, I feel like we will be having this conversation again at some point. Thank you, Ms. Torres. If you notice, I'm sitting up in my seat because I'm going to put on my teacher slash counselor hat. And this is a great start, this policy. Uh, in terms of the committee, really thanking you all for the great work. But as an educator, I would be very, very upset if I'm trying to teach or if I'm counseling a student in my office that a student is sitting there on the cell phone. According to the anticipated outcomes, it says student engagement will increase. Student achievement will increase. Students are not engaged because they are focused and glued to those cell phones. The steps probably need to be lessened a little bit, not that we're trying to be punitive, not that we are asking and that may be a conversation later on to get rid of cell phones completely, but we already, we've already been doing it for years. When they do standardized tests, there are no cell phones. There's no rebellion against students when they're doing SOLs, when they're doing AP testing. The first thing we do, for those of us who are leading the test, or proctoring the test, we collect cell phones. And they're in that testing room four hours, testing, morning and afternoon. There has never been an issue with students giving up their cell phones when they are taking an AP test. So we're already doing some of that. So we have to find a fine medium in terms of, because teachers need to have their respect. They cannot teach when students are engaged on cell phones. And I'm speaking from the voice of experience, having taught, well, well more so in counseling because I was at the high school level, when students come in and you're having a conversation with a student and they're on the cell phone, that, that to me, they're not engaged. So if we are working toward these ultimate outcomes of increasing uh, achievement and engaging our students, we have to come to consensus about the cell phones. I like the idea of the pouches because it, you're just simply 45 minutes to 90 minutes, they're, they're simply putting their phones away. Then they collect those phones after class and off they go to the next class. But during that instructional time, they need to be engaged in learning. And if this continues, it's, it's, it's gonna show up later on we continue to allow students to be engaged in those cell phones during class time. And I think it's unfair to the teachers that they have to compete, as Ms. Horn said, with those cell phones. So this is a good start. And I think what we can, we do, we've done outreach and, um, with the parents and we, we had a, a, a very diverse group of people on that committee. It's now time to act, to implement a policy and I know these teachers because I've worked with them. They're great teachers and they're gonna rise to the occasion so that all students will be actively engaged in learning. And this is important that we come to a consensus with this policy and maybe tweak some of those steps. And that will help the administrators as well as the teachers and that everybody will be engaged in the learning process. 
Dr. Gurley. I do want to thank the committee for the hard work. And I know that uh, Ms. Horn uh, and Mr. Jocelyn um, were two of our pioneers in terms of getting this work together um, week after week, just hearing the plight of teachers and what they're experiencing. Um, I think that as I am just jotting and, and just what's happening here is that we all agree that we value teachers, um, you know, teachers can work anywhere. So let's make this environment conducive for them. Um, and we all agree that we wanna put students first. Um, and I think the difficult part here is we all at the end of the day want the room to be cell phone free and so that learning can happen. Um, I think the difficult part in all of this is the outcome. Um, the outcome is the, the problem here. And, and really what this comes down to for me is that, you know, teachers want planning periods. So you don't want to go and pick up cell phones. I, I, want, I want to plan during my designated planning period. As the administrator, I want to be in classrooms, providing feedback, um, meeting with parents when needed, so everyone has time that they really don't want to have encumbered with the cell phone. And what has been happening is we have been trying to enforce parts of this. So I think this, as it's been said this evening, that this is, um, this is heading in the right direction. Um, it's ultimately what we have to agree on is when we get to the place of there's no cell phones, that we all are saying the same thing. And this is not about the board, this is about teachers, this is about students, it's that we want the same things. And I think what we hear over and over, I think we even had someone in the chat as we've been sitting here who are disagreeing even with what's happening here because they feel like students need phones. And this is what I spend a lot of my time with trying to convince people why you know, the phone needs to be away. The, the administrators, I mean, they're limited in numbers, more students than administrators. So it's like putting out that fire of, you know, getting the phone put away and what do you do with students who are not complying? And I think that as I think about some of the conversations that I've had, we know who was impacted by this. We know that the, dis that the discipline was not consistent, that more black and brown students were overrepresented in the discipline of the cell phones and they weren't disciplined at the same rate um, as their non-black and brown peers. So it's where we have to arrive is how we handle the student um, because really, I mean, what happens is the removal of a student because of the phone. Um, and that's, and then there are all these unintended consequences, disproportionality by disability, by race, by gender, and the list goes on. So we just have to take this opportunity to build the capacity in our families to do that outreach. And maybe where we land is, this is a no cell phone building, but it, regardless of what the plan looks like, there's going to be a lot of work. And we have to all agree on that, that even if we say there are no cell phones, there are going to still be a lot of steps in between for someone. Um, and so we have to help educate people on the front end that this is what's coming for your child. We have to all stand in it together that these this will be the outcome. But regardless of which way we go, and I am perfectly fine with it being no phones, the steps part will not change. There will still be a lot of steps for someone. And, you know, you know, don't want it to be the teacher, of course, but we will now have a different expectation um, for the administrator of the CSAs. And so I just think that we will get there. This is the, this is the roadmap. And ultimately, if we pull the data and it's not working, then we can pivot. Um, if it's working, then great, um, but it's still going to be a lot of work for people, uh, and it's about relationship building. Um, it's about how we 
um, you know, how we intervene with students who don't respond um, to their expectations in the building. So in a perfect world, we would send messages on a pigeon and we can only do that from outside when school's <laughs> not, when school is not going. Um, but right now we're gonna work with the cards we've been dealt and um, I hope and pray we can get to a place that works for Charlottesville City Schools and supports that strategic plan. Mr. Chairman, if yes. I may, um, I am happy to convene the committee again, or at least who's available. I know people will be on vacation to tweak, to look back at those interventions, to minimize those as best as we can, or go back to what it was before. Um, but I would like to share one piece of good news. Uh, our Summer Academy Administrator, Ms. Yumika Webb-Jordan, is implementing the plan in our CHS Summer Academy right now. I know we're only on day four, but she said it's working. The kids are responding. So it's a smaller scale. So I don't wanna to get too overly enthusiastic or excited about it, but it is working as of these four days. Uh, but but I'll, I'll reach back out to the committee and see who we can get back together. I, I know that we were waiting for tonight. Didn't wanna purchase yonder pouches, uh, pencil boxes until we present it tonight to make sure that the board was okay with us moving forward with the plan. Not, not, not necessarily in action, but just want to present it and get your thoughts about it. Thank you. I think Ms. McKeever said she wanted to make a comment after everybody else had spoken. Thank you so much. I feel like we got to a place where um, I feel comfortable. So thank you very much to the committee and of course to all the board with their great comments. So thank you. Okay. I just, if I could. Add one more comment. You have one more comment? Yes. I would just be remiss if I didn't add, because we're talking about no cell phones and cell phones uh, in the classroom, that there are students for which they will have to have their cell phones. Uh, there is a young student in my life who um, was diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes, so she has to have it to monitor her insulin levels. So I know that there are some students for which they will have to have them no matter what. Thank you, Ms. Morrisberger, and thank you, Ms. McKeever. Are there any other comments? Going to cell phone? All right, thank you, Dr. Ode. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, another opportunity for community members to make comments. So I guess I'll start with the Zoom room. Are there any folks in the Zoom room? Um, there was someone who sent an email who wished to make public comment via Zoom, so um, I'll just ask that person if they still wish to make those comments, if they could hit the thumbs up button on their page or send a chat so that we can promote you to um, a talking host position. And if not, then I will be forwarding the chat message I received to, um, to Dr. Odie's committee for review. All right, thank you. Is there anyone here in the room that would like to come forth and speak at this time? Ms. Horn, state your name and your address. Uh, Jennifer Horn, uh, 700 Druid Avenue. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for the cell phone initiative and for everyone seeming to understand the weight of it. And how, for how so many people said like, oh, more on our teachers. I was just, that was just really nice to hear as a teacher. So thank you. Now I'm gonna say something totally different. <laughs> um, it's about the strategic plan. I also had the privilege of being on that fantastic committee. And a note that I've given, but because there were so many people and I think I was just waiting too long. Um, so I would love just to say, I'll, I'll write it in the notes, but um, only one place in the entire strategic plan does it m mention our unleveled classes. We've, we started unleveling 14 years ago, I think. And when we first started, there was so much training involved. Teachers had to go to UVA and train. We had regular meetings and regular training. 
And what's happened is more of our classes and more of our disciplines have unleveled, but the training has gone away. And I think it should be a part of our strategic plan. I, it's, I mean, it's one of our greatest equity initiatives and it's so important and it's a beautiful thing, but it's really hard for a teacher who's never done it before to come in and have this incredibly varied class in front of them and not have the training to deal with it well. So I would just love for that to become a part of our strategic plan more explicitly and less like under the, under the covers. But thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time? Well, thank you so much. We now will have comments from the board and I'll start with Mr. Morris. Uh, no comments for me, thank you. Ms. Morris-Berger. I don't have any comments at this time. Ms. Torres. <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, just want to say thank you to everybody again for all their work. Um, thank you, Ms. Horn. I saw Mr. Diggin, Ms. Brown. Um, anybody else who's, who's taken time today, Ms. Rasnick, um, to, to show up and to be here for this. And, and also want to acknowledge um, the comment made um, at our first public comment opportunity. Um, and I just want to say that I'm proud to be on this board. I'm proud to be a part of Charlottesville City Schools School Board. I am proud that we as a division value and embrace diversity, period. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Torres. Ms. McKeever. Dr. Kraft. Well, I continue just to be um, <clears throat> so appreciative and amazed by um, our staff and our teachers, all of our staff, our administrative staff, our leadership team. Um, <clears throat> and I too am very proud to be a member of this board and this school division. Um, and I wish everybody some time off and, um, and a good summer. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. Ms. McKeever. I think you're muted. I'm on, uh, I have no comment. All right, thank you. Ms. Dooley. My only comment is to just make a connection. I'm um, kind of going along with our discussion about cell phones and, um, you know, how this evolves, but also the new communication system that we had a presentation about, I think earlier this month. Um, that I think there's some opportunities with this new communication system to address some of the concerns that exist, um, I think particularly amongst parents um, in their ability to receive information, um, especially in cases of emergency or just kind of high stress moments. Um, I think I don't want to lose, I guess, that component um, that I think we are taking some proactive steps um, you know, to enhance and improve what I think we already have great communication. Thank you, Ms. Chuck. I can't see you here uh, on my screen. Um, you know, but I think as we're having this conversation about, about cell phones that, um, you know, that's an important piece to keep uh, in mind as well. Thank you, Ms. Dooley. And I would also like to add that um, I'd like to thank everyone for their hard work on the various committees from the cell phone to strategic plan committee. Um, also, I want to thank my fellow board members for all the hard work that, that we do every, every day, every month when we come together. And Dr. Gurley, always thank you for your, your wonderful insight in terms of how we are moving. We're going to move this school system forward. And, and thank also, I want to thank the parents um, for their input and the community members. We cannot we all have to collaborate and, and work together and that's so important. So thank you. Now we have comments from the superintendent. Um, I will keep mine brief. I just wanna thank all of my, 
all the people that I work with, um, all of this work happens because they are great. Um, so I just appreciate you all. Um, I too want to just kind of um, echo what was said um, this evening um, by Ms. Espo. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down with um, five Johnson parents, um, jo five Johnson families today with regards to the matter that took place. And, um, you know, I would not be here if I didn't think that this community would accept me as who I am. Um, and that is why I'm here. Um, and so my priority is to keep our students safe. Um, and I just, you know, I just wanna apologize to our families because it just feels like, you know, I have a part in that in keeping our children safe and, and to know that um, someone compromised our safety. Um, it's um, very saddening, um, but I will continue to um, fight the good fight, keep our children safe and make sure that everyone feels seen and heard uh, because that truly is what Charlottesville, it's what it means to me, feel seen, heard and included. Um, and so I appreciate that. And I just appreciate everyone for, this is the last school board meeting of the 22, 23 school year. And so I just thank all everyone for their hard work, uh, Ms. Green, Ms. Thacker. And so have a great summer if you get one. <laughs> thank you. So we now have work um, session wrap up by Ms. Lewis. Nothing, okay. Well, the announcement for upcoming meetings, I guess that will be August 3rd here at Charlottesville High School Media Center at 5 p.m. And before I adjourn the meeting, I wanna wish each and every one of you all a safe and happy summer. So there is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. This meeting is now adjourned and have a wonderful, wonderful summer. And I'll see you in August. <laughs>